You probably think you're in complete control of your decisions and thoughts, but how often are they guided by something else? Something you don't even notice occurring deep within your mind. Here are 21 cognitive mind traps, fallacies, biases, and other phenomenon that exists within your brain. Strange things that are hardwired into all human minds. You may go through your entire life or well into adulthood completely unaware that you're carrying around these thinking errors and mental shortcuts that influence your day-to-day -day thinking. You can't turn them off or delete them from your brain, but being one of the few people that can notice when they arise in your mind and knowing the situations they're likely to act upon your decision making is one of the first steps to becoming a more thoughtful and rational thinker. This two-part series is mainly inspired by the works of Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman and his amazing book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Cognitive Dissonance A fox snuck up to a vine. He stared intently at the juicy purple overripe grapes. He tried to get at the grapes, but they were too high. Frustrated, he tried again. He launched himself upward, but came no closer to the fruit. He leapt for a third time, this time landing with a thud. Still no grapes. The fox turned up his nose. I don't really care. Only grapes that aren't even ripe. Why would I want sour grapes? He turned around and walked back into the forest. This is one of Aesop's fables and also where we get the term sour grapes from. The fox had three choices. Get to the grapes, admit that he wasn't smart or skilled enough to obtain the grapes, or to reinterpret the situation retrospectively. Or put simply, create a new belief that is in conflict with the first belief. When we choose option three and we have two held beliefs that are in conflict with one another, that is an example of cognitive dissonance. If you interview for a job but someone else gets it, instead of reasoning that the other person was better, you tell yourself that the job was no good anyway, or that the interviewer was unfair. When people can't get what they want, they often tell themselves it isn't what they wanted anyway. When people don't want to follow through on something, they often find new beliefs to rationalize the action to fit the first belief. You think all rich people are greedy and evil, but you also want to be rich. The dissonance leads to discomfort, mental stress, and anxiety. If the dissonance grows more intense, it can lead to depression. If you notice dissonance, you can ask yourself, what are the two beliefs that are competing and are incompatible? Am I telling myself this new belief because I couldn't get what I wanted? Or is this new belief because I need an excuse to explain away my first belief? What actions can I take to change my behavior or mindset and eliminate the dissonance? Because when it comes to cognitive dissonance, you can play the clever fox all you want, but you'll never get the grapes that way. The Spotlight Effect You arrive five minutes late to the office and you feel like everyone is judging you. It's your first day at the gym and you feel like everyone is watching you. You spill a small amount of sauce on your shirt and you feel so embarrassed because you think the whole party is going to notice. The Spotlight Effect is the phenomenon in which people tend to believe people are observing them more than they are. People are seldom interested in you and your actions as much as you think. So do yourself a favor, stop overestimating how much people are observing you and reduce the anxiety that is probably just the result of the spotlight effect. The anchoring effect. Whenever we have to guess something, let's say the population of Russia, we use anchors, starting with something we know for sure to be true, so it must be greater than one, must be less than seven billion, and is less than the population of China, we then take these anchors and explore the unfamiliar territory. Unfortunately, we use anchors when we don't need to. Take a moment to pause and look at these two questions. Is the height of the tallest redwood tree more or less than 1200 feet? What is your best guess about the height of the tallest redwood? If we ask group A these two questions and group B these two questions, we would consistently get very different answers because of the anchoring effect. The words and numbers we use anchors people's decisions. But the anchoring effect doesn't only apply to numbers that appear informative, such as in the tree example. According to Kahneman, anchors that are obviously random can be just as effective as potentially informative anchors. An experiment was conducted on German judges with an average of 15 years experience. 
Each judge was read a description of a woman who had been shoplifting, then asked to roll a pair of dice, which were loaded to only add up to three or nine. As soon as the dice stopped, they were asked to answer how long they would sentence this woman. The judges who rolled a nine, on average, gave her an eight-month sentence. The judges who rolled a three, on average, gave her a five-month sentence. The researchers found that the anchoring effect was influencing their judgments. Numerous other studies using arbitrary numbers like the last digits of phone numbers or social security numbers also confirmed our anchoring bias. In sales and negotiations, anchors are being used all the time. And there will be people who are willing and able to set up this mind trap and exploit the anchoring effect against you. The car salesman setting a high price from the start so that the price that he actually wants to get from you seems like a good deal. The $150 dress at the front of the store sets the anchor for the $50 dress at the back of the store. Online stores, salary negotiations, and real estate deals are all playgrounds for the anchoring effect. And it's one of our most powerful biases. You can't turn it off, but you can remind yourself of your vulnerability to it and try to proactively set your own mental anchors before going into any sales or negotiation environment. Take a look at these examples. Let's say I want to sell my book. You can get my online course for $1,999, or you can get my book for just $15. I anchor you to the higher price first, so that the price of my book seems like a bargain. If I wanted to sell my course, on the other hand, I would need to find a better anchor. It costs $135,000 to go to college and learn the same things I'm going to teach you in my online course for only $1,999. If Sarah wanted to buy a $50,000 car and experiment with anchoring, she wouldn't show her partner a bunch of similar priced cars. She would show him a few $90,000 cars she likes first, and after she gets an audible gasp at the price, then she would show him the car she actually wants. And now it doesn't seem as expensive. The price you anchor first determines how people feel about the value of your offer. They have sent us the asking price for the home. Let's not let the numbers influence our thinking. Set it aside. Let's perform our own due diligence and arrive at our own number. Our objective in this negotiation is to move first and get them anchored to this number. The Halo Effect What do you think about Alan and Ben? Alan is intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, stubborn, and envious. Ben is envious, stubborn, critical, impulsive, industrious, and intelligent. If you're like most people, you see Alan in a better light than you do Ben, even though the traits mentioned are exactly the same. When it comes to the halo effect, sequence matters. More weight is given to the first piece of information we receive. The first piece of information helps us quickly create a story of the person or situation in our minds. Sure, Alan is stubborn and envious, but that is only because he is intelligent and wants to win in business. And yes, Ben is intelligent, but he uses that intelligence in envious ways. The halo effect occurs when a single initial aspect of a person or thing determines and affects or outshines how we see the full picture. When you first start dating someone, both parties in the relationship are on their best behavior. You start to develop a halo of positive thoughts around this person. Small traits you dislike might begin to pop up, but often go unnoticed because the halo, the positive emotions, and the initial information you gathered on this person is blinding out any of the negatives. The honeymoon phase of a relationship is often when the halo effect influences your judgment the most. If we learn that someone graduated from a prestigious university, the halo effect will distort all other traits we attribute to that person without any evidence. Bernie Madoff was the darling of Wall Street, a legendary investor. The amazing returns and reputation of his company were the halo that made people also conclude his company must be trustworthy. The halo outshone the numbers that made no sense and the underlying fact that he was running the biggest Ponzi scheme in history. Numerous studies have shown that attractive people are automatically perceived as nicer, more honest, and more intelligent. The halo effect can also be found in schools. If a student answers two essay questions and the teacher gives the first essay a high grade, he or she is prone to subconsciously give that more weight and give the second essay a higher grade also, and vice versa for low grades. 
In the work environment, the standard practice of most meetings is to have open discussions on a topic. Daniel Kahneman in the book Thinking Fast and Slow argues that it is better to gather independent judgments on the topic from everyone in the group before the issue is discussed because far too often the opinions of the first people to talk are given too much weight and influence the group's input, especially if the boss speaks first. Modern research suggests that the old saying first impressions last turns out to be true. After meeting someone for the first time, our judgment of that person can influence us for a long time into the future. We jump to conclusions and our perception of true characteristics is distorted by the halo effect. To combat this, try to move beyond the first appearance of someone or something and decorrelate error. Remember that your brain is trying to help you by making the most complete story it can on the limited information it is provided. The problem is that these mental shortcut stories we tell ourselves about a person or thing are often inaccurate from reality. He knows nothing about her personality. All he's going by is how good looking she is. He's succumbing to the halo effect. Hey look, this new applicant graduated from Harvard. She doesn't have any experience in this position, but I think we should interview her anyway. Let's gather ideas independently on this topic before the meeting. I don't want my ideas to influence the groups. Gambler's Fallacy Three times a coin is flipped and lands on heads each time. Let's say that someone forces you to wager thousands of dollars of your own money on the next toss. Would you bet on heads or tails? If you think like most people, you will almost always choose tails, although heads is equally likely. But why? We believe in some kind of balancing force in the universe. If we ask people to choose which sequence is more probable, most would pick the top sequence. But both sequences are equally probable. We generally underestimate the likelihood of streaks occurring by chance. We are led to believe that something needs to change due to the gambler's fallacy. However, there is no such balancing force. The coin cannot remember that heads was flipped three times in a row, just as the ball cannot remember that it landed on black. Casinos love the gambler's fallacy because it creates the illusion in the gambler's mind that they can predict where the balance of the dice or roulette wheel will go next. This fallacy can apply anywhere there is a sequence of decisions. That awkward feeling you get when you've answered five C's in a row of a multiple choice exam is this fallacy at work. A University of Chicago review found asylum judges were 19% less likely to approve an asylum seeker if they had just approved the previous two. The same person applying for a loan was more likely to get approved for a loan if the previous two applicants were rejected and was more likely to be rejected if the previous two applicants were approved. Similar findings were also found when analyzing the sequence of decisions of baseball umpires. Take a closer look at the independent and interdependent events around you. Independent events are not influenced by balancing forces of nature. The contrast effect. If you see some leather seats for $3,000, they may seem a little expensive. If you're buying an $80,000 car on the other hand, the $3,000 leather seat upgrade seems almost like nothing. Research shows that people will walk an extra 10 minutes if it means saving $10 on food. However, nearly all wouldn't walk 10 minutes to save $10 on a $1,000 suit. It's easy to think something is attractive, large, or expensive when it sits next to something ugly, small, or cheap. Absolute judgments can be difficult to make. Try to catch yourself the next time you go shopping to see if your purchasing decisions are being influenced by the contrast effect. Confirmation Bias You have an existing belief about something, you go in search of evidence that supports that belief, which further reinforces the belief. And you continue this cycle. If you come across evidence that doesn't support your belief, you filter the disconfirming evidence and your brain forgets it after a short period of time. We never like to learn we've believed in a falsehood or made a bad decision, which is why we tend to filter what information we pay attention to. This is confirmation bias, the tendency to interpret new information so that it becomes compatible with our existing theories and beliefs. This bias is subtle, unconscious, and always present in the mind when rational thinking is needed. As opposed to the scientific method, where you form a hypothesis or ask a question, gather evidence and then test the hypothesis, this is hard work and may entail some unpleasant truths. This is John. John begins with a simple theory or belief. He turns to Google. He subconsciously goes in search of the first information that confirms his belief and the confirmation bias takes care of filtering out the rest. 
Finding information that proves you are wrong is one of the best ways to determine if you are right. And philosophers of science would tell us to combat this bias by trying to refute the hypothesis. But rarely do people actively try to seek out disconfirming evidence to their beliefs. We hate to be wrong, so why would we actively try to seek out information that is in conflict with those beliefs? To make matters worse, the biggest platforms now tailor content to personal interests and browsing history, supercharging confirmation bias on a mass scale. We find ourselves in a sea of one-sided content amongst communities of like-minded people, also referred to as echo chambers, thereby reinforcing our convictions and the confirmation bias becomes stronger. Not only do we need to combat our own confirmation bias, social platforms are aiding this bias by filtering what we are shown and not exposing us to opposing points of view. The more you conform the facts to fit your beliefs, the narrower your perspective becomes, until that narrow reality becomes all that you can see. Confirmation bias is the genesis of the I'm always correct ego, especially in political discourse. What planet are they living on? They must be living in an alternate reality. I'm completely right about this. Look at all the facts on my side. As a result of confirmation bias, we have a high degree of confidence. We feel deep down that we are right. If someone challenges our opinions, we tend to become defensive and even hostile. As opposing perspectives become narrower, discourse about facts that are being interpreted and filtered differently becomes nearly impossible because both sides of an argument are seeing the evidence through the lens of their theories and only looking out for what confirms their existing beliefs. Echo chambers are the flywheels for frequent repetition and dissemination of ideas. The same ideas are shared, liked, and repeated, and any new beliefs are quickly shut down. All divergent thinking and opinions begin to disappear. When people hear the same thing repeated enough times, the facts may as well go out the window. According to Daniel Kahneman, a reliable way to make people believe in falsehood is frequent repetition, because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth. There is no way to eliminate confirmation bias, only ways to reduce its effect on you. First is to simply become aware that this mind trap exists. If time does allow you to reflect, try to think gray. If you truly want to become an independent thinker, you need to suspend judgments, explore the gray areas, and expand beyond the hive mind of the group. Try to get your information from a variety of sources and avoid being influenced into a belief because it is what others are telling you to think or has been repeated enough times you accept it as truth. Confirmation bias is a perspective narrower. Try to widen your perspective, because in most cases the objective facts lie somewhere in between in the grey area. The Bader meinhof Phenomenon You buy a certain brand of car and all of a sudden you start seeing that car everywhere, whereas you didn't in the past. When you learn a new word or concept, suddenly you start seeing it everywhere in your life. You start thinking, wow, this is weird. How is it possible I've never seen this word in my life, and now I've seen it three times this week? Or why do I keep seeing those new shoes I bought everywhere I go? They must be becoming so popular. The bader meinhof phenomenon is an illusion in which, after noticing something for the first time, there is a tendency to notice it more often. It occurs when increased awareness of something creates the illusion that it is appearing more often. This phenomenon is augmented by two other biases. The recency effect, which inflates the importance of recent stimuli, and confirmation bias which confirms in your mind these strange coincidences you think you're having and then perpetuates your search to keep confirming that these coincidences must have some kind of meaning. Basically, our brains are master pattern recognition machines that are always searching for meaning in data. What is amazing are all the patterns and stimuli flooding past you every single day that your brain simply ignores because it's not in your awareness. We only see the things we are looking out for. In reality, you have most likely seen that word or car a number of times, but your mind simply wasn't interested in noticing it. Ziegenick Effect We can almost always remember incomplete tasks, but we easily forget completed tasks. To put simply, incomplete tasks will stick around in our memory longer than completed tasks. Originally, it was believed that the only way to prevent the Ziegenick effect from gnawing away at our thoughts was to complete the incomplete tasks. However, further research into the Ziegenick effect found that simply having or writing down a plan to complete the task was enough to stop the effect. So if you find yourself awake at night with these incomplete tasks stressing you out, grab a pen and pad and write down a quick plan to get the job done. Getting the task out of your head and onto paper combats this effect and will give you more peace of mind. The Paradox of Choice At a supermarket, two experiments were conducted. 
In the first experiment, 24 different types of jam were available to freely test and buy for a discounted price. In the second experiment, only six different types of jam were available to freely test and buy for a discounted price. The first experiment attracted 60% of shoppers and 3% bought jam. The second experiment attracted 40% of shoppers and 30% bought jam. Even though more shoppers were initially attracted to more variety, with less choices the supermarket was able to sell 10x the amount of jam. This is the paradox of choice. For most people, a large selection of any given product is seen as a net positive. But once the number of choices increases past the threshold, our subjective state becomes negative and leads to inner paralysis and decision fatigue. The paradox of choice can also be found in modern day dating. In the past, you would marry people you met locally. Nowadays, we have too many choices. And you may think that all that variety would make it easier to find the perfect partner, but more optimal decisions can be made when given a smaller amount of options to choose from. When faced with a small number of options, people can easily weigh the pros and cons of each and be fairly satisfied with whichever option they chose. When faced with a large number of options, knowing which option is best becomes more difficult, and the more options there are, the more chances there are of feeling regret. With more options, the more you feel the need to compare. The attractive features of the alternatives diminish the satisfaction in your final choice. Even if we made an excellent decision, the opportunity costs of the other options subtract from the overall satisfaction of our choice. Too many choices often leads to people not making any choice and giving up on the endeavor altogether.